Hey, Chris here, and today I would like to show you some ideas for making Christmas tree toppers with things that you might find outside. In 2019, our McDonough County Master Gardeners, they decorated a Christmas tree for the Macomb Christmas Tree Festival using items that they found in their yards, gardens, and in natural areas. It was a spectacular and inspiring display and really a testament to what you can do with just items that you find outside. Today, I would like to show you two tree topper ideas. Uh, we're gonna be focusing predominantly on using milkweed seed pods for this one. Traditionally, Christmas tree toppers are either an angel or a star. And so today we are going to do both of those. And so first, let's get started on making our angel. So pictured here are all of the materials and tools for making an angel a tree topper. Essentially what it is, is a stick and some milkweed pods, and that's it. Um, and from there, it can become more and more elaborate. But I want to show you first how to build the basic structure. And from there, your imagination is endless in what you can use to decorate this with. For the stick or the body of the angel, uh, look for kind of a thicker stick. You know, about an inch in diameter would be a good size. But keep in mind, there's no really hard and fast rules here. There's a lot of wiggle room. And it's really up to you about, you know, the size and how big you want the angel to be. I selected a a fallen stick from a sycamore tree, and I love sycamore with their exfoliating bark that reveals tans and browns and whites and reds even. It's a beautiful tree, and so I also wanted it to be kind of the showcase piece also for my angel that I was making. The other nice thing about sycamore trees is they tend to drop a lot of limbs, making finding one easy. Now how long you cut your branch really depends on how you plan to affix this to your tree. For me, I'm just going to leave it a little bit longer, you know, about a foot long in total, and I'm just going to insert about half of it into that top portion of the tree to keep that sitting there. You could also have a shorter stick and just put some wire on the back to attach that to the top upright branch of your Christmas tree. The other thing you can choose is whether to leave your cut ends a little bit rough or a little bit smoother. Um, it's really up to you. Would you like to leave them a little bit more rough and jagged? That's a little bit more natural looking. Uh, or you can use a, a circular saw and you can make a cut to smooth things out, which might be useful if you plan on putting any type of like, say, a, a round wooden ball or an acorn or something for the head on the top. Now that we've selected the proper stick for the body of the angel, now we need our milkweed seed pods. First thing you're going to do is pick them up and start cleaning out all of the duff and seed out from the inside. Now that you have your milkweed pods cleaned out, go ahead and save the seed for planting somewhere later. Uh, you have a choice to make. Uh, which way do you want the seed pods to face? Do you want them to be the front or the back of the angel? I like to face the outside of the pod to the front. Um, but you can do a couple different things. You could even turn it around and you can do uh, colorful paint on the inside or glitter or something like that to make the inside more shiny and face that out. But I like the kind of the rustic, uh, rough colored uh, outside portion of these seed pods. So I'm going to use those to face to the outside. Now in terms of where you place the wings on the stick, you kind of want them to be up towards the head. Now, if you're going to, again, place, you know, something round on top to create the head, which you could use, something to do that. Um, you would place them probably closer to the top, but if the stick itself is going to be the head, uh, then you could place them lower down on, to, on that body, so to speak. Once you have arranged where you want the wings to be, you just use your hot glue gun and you glue them onto the stick. There. Now the glue has cooled and this is the basic shape for the angel tree topper. Now from here there's a lot of different roads that we can go down in terms of how we want to decorate and create a really cool tree topper. So from this point on it's really up to you what you would like to do next for your angel. I think for me I would like to maybe uh, add some some arms, maybe a halo, and possibly a head onto the angel. And again the way you do this really the sky's the limit in terms of what you can find out there. For the arms, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, just a thin twig that I found outside and just using some pruners, I am going to cut the part that attaches to the body at an angle and then kind of a more of a flat angle uh, towards the end. And I'll see maybe about the same length as the wings. And then with these arms, I will then just attach those to the body. 
with, again, using hot glue. So next, I want to try to attach this burr oak acorn to the top, and that will be the head of the angel. I need to hold it for a little bit because the burr oak acorn is huge and heavy. And kind of the last touch I would like to put on my angel here would be a halo. And so actually from the same sycamore that I found the branch, I actually found a branch that has had white bark. And so I took a circular saw and I cut these into small little cookies uh, so that you could see this nice, beautiful white bark, the sycamore tree right here. So I'm going to drill a hole into it. And then I just have some baling twine that I'm going to use to wire this above the head. So this twine should slide right through this hole. Like so, and then I'm just gonna take a pair of pliers and these pliers, I'm just gonna use it to bend and then crimp down this wire on top of the little sycamore cookie. And then once you have this crimped down tight, you can kind of create a second crimp on the bottom side so that the cookie doesn't slide down. Now, what you could do is you could wrap the wire around the body very tightly. Um, I think what I'm going to do though is I'm just going to slide this on the back side and use my hot glue gun again and affix that to the back side. And there you have it. A simple, charming angel Christmas tree topper made with items that we found outside. Our next Christmas tree topper is going to be a star made simply with milkweed seed pods and so the first thing we have to do is clean out the seed pod. Now for this we're going to need at least five halves seed pods so about two and a half milkweed seed pods. All right for this tree topper what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by just kind of arranging things laying things out and testing to see how I like them. So if this is going to be a star so we need five points now, like the angel, you can face the seed pods from the outside or from the inside of the seed pod, you know, as the, the outfacing part of the ornament. But for me, I still really like the outside, like the texture and the kind of that rustic looking color of this dried out seed pod, so I'm gonna use that. But I have seen some really cool ideas online where they have taken some gold spray paint, they've sprayed the inside of this and they've decorated the inside using uh, found little leaves and flowers and little things that they find outside uh, for the for the star. So again, this is just the basic shape. It's up to you to determine how you want to design and make this your own. So now I have my seed pods arranged the way that I want them for the star. Next is going to glue them together. Now don't worry about this gap here in the center. We have something to go there in just a second. As we wait for the glue to cool, it's time to pick out what we want to put in the center. Now, this can be up to you. Now, sort of like our angel, we could use one of those sycamore little tree cookies that I cut out from that branch, and that's perfectly fine. Um, I think, trying to choose, uh, we could also use a, another burr oak acorn to go with that theme there. It actually looks really, really cute. Uh, I think, though, what I want to try, because I haven't made this one yet before, I'm going to try a sweet gum ball. I love sweet gum trees, so I'm going to see what that looks like right there. Again, we're going to use this to help hide and mask some of this uh, kind of this gap that we have in the middle. Now, in terms of how you attach this to the tree, like the angel, you can wire it up with a piece of wire on the back. I think, though, I am going to attach a stick to the back of the uh, star so I can just slide and insert it either on top or even this could work uh, in a bush outside or somewhere else on the Christmas tree. Also keep in mind whatever sticks that you select for this project whether it's the angel or for this make sure that they still are fairly durable. You don't want them to be completely rotten and falling apart. And there you have it. Two Christmas tree toppers that you can create using things that you find outside and this is a fantastic project to involve kids with. Uh, the, the thing that I really wanted to show you today was just the basic forms that you can use to then elaborate to your heart's content to create something that you or your family and friends can gather around and celebrate the holidays with. Thanks for watching.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. We are the Horticulturists here to answer your gardening questions. My name is Candace Hart. I'm the State Master Gardener Specialist here for Illinois Extension, and I'm based here in Bloomington, so in central Illinois, and I love to chat about all things flowers, so I've got a easy DIY with flowers that we're going to talk about uh, today, but luckily, I've got some other awesome horticulturists with us today who like to chat about other horticultural topic. So Ryan, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. I'm Ryan Pankaw, a horticulture educator based out of Champaign. So I serve Champaign, Ford, Vermilion, and Iroquois counties here in central Illinois. And uh, yeah, if, if you've tuned into our show before, you know, like my specialty is kind of trees and woody plants, but I also like native plants. I also like vegetable gardening and other things. But um, Kelly couldn't join us today, but you can see we have an awesome replacement for Kelly. Mm -hmm. Ken, would you mind introducing yourself? You've been been on the show before, but uh, give folks an idea of what your specialty is. I'm Ken Johnson. I'm also a horticulture educator. Uh, I am in Jacksonville, so I cover Calhoun, Cass, Green, Morgan, and Scott County, so west central uh, part of the state. Uh, my background, I guess, is insects. Uh, I am the Kelly replacement today, I guess. <laughs> uh, insects and um, vegetable gardening, fruit and vegetable gardening stuff. Know enough about flowers and stuff to be dangerous, but I'll, I'll defer to you too on that stuff. Awesome. Well, we appreciate you hopping in, Ken. You and you and Kelly are always our insect go-tos. So hopefully we'll have some, some insect uh, topics today. So uh, everybody watching, if you have any gardening questions, whether it's about what we're talking about today or anything, we are happy to help you. So you can start adding those into the comment box and we will answer those as we go through. We've kind of got a little bit of a hodgepodge of holiday December gardening topics we're going to chat about today. So we're happy to answer anything you have. But obviously, we advertise the show as kind of DIY holiday decoration topics. So we've got a couple of things to, to touch on there. Um, so Ken, you want to kick us off? Maybe show us what you've got in terms of uh, air plants, because I think those are an awesome gift item, an awesome thing you can craft with. You want to show us what, you, what you've got? Sure. And if people have tuned in early in the past, you've probably seen video of me do, talking about these. Yeah. Uh, but here I've just got one of these kind of glass open-faced ornaments um, that I've got an air plant in. Um, so this, for this, I just put a bunch of sand on the bottom. Um, I chose white sand to do kind of a winter theme, look like snow. Uh, mm -hmm. Throw in some bark and air plant, and I've got a little a little bird, snowman. <laughs> oh, snowman! Oh, snowman bird. Bird would be cute, though. Yeah. Go to your craft store or raid the uh, craft closet and find a little <laughs> text in there and and stuff. See, I've yeah, I've got I've done some with birds. Um, done the same thing with succulents. Um, just use a. Uh, succulent mix, cactus mix for the soil and there, put them in there and then you can kind of decorate. Uh, with air plants, you kind of want to miss these probably every other day daily or take them out and soak them in water for a half hour, hour or so and then put them back in so they're um, staying wet, but they don't have roots or anything like that. So you don't have to worry about them rooting or anything like that. So fairly low maintenance and yeah, kind of put them in front of a window so they get a lot of light and kind of keep them year round. Change out your decor depending on the season. If you want, so nice, yeah. So you could have it hanging on the hanging on the tree for Christmas, and then take it off and place it on a shelf or somewhere else, and, and switch out the seasons, huh? And and there's some of them. So this one's got a hook on the top. There's some that also have a. This got an eyelet on the top. Some of them also have a hook on the bottom, so you can chain them yeah. together. So you can have a long chain of them hanging. Um, if you've got like a hook in the ceiling or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that would be cool if you had a hook above the window and just kind of hang them in front of the window. That'd be pretty. Are, there, uh, are they kind of like full sun then? Or what's their light? What's their light requirement? Yeah, so so once I've got a, our house, we've got them in a south facing window. Um, we've got a long chain of them um, above our kitchen sink. I was thinking maybe, you know, there'd be enough humidity there to not have to constantly water them, but there's not. So I've lost. <laughs> so I didn't have water them as much as I should have. Darn it. Yeah, if, if anybody's thinking about these and you have a bathroom with a window, that would be. Awesome. I wish I, I because the bathroom gives you that perfect kind of human environment, but most of the time we don't have a window in the bathroom, which kind of, then it's not going to work. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Love those. So very easy kind of DIY ornament and um, would be great to give as a gift too if you have somebody that you're not sure what to get them. Air plants are always a, an easy one, I think, to give as a gift too. 
Awesome. Cool. Well, the couple that I had um, done quick to show to were also DIY. So I mentioned I'm flowers is my gardening thing. So I'm always kind of drying um, little tidbits of flowers throughout the season that either I can't use or I'm growing them specifically for dried flowers. So a lot of times this year, I'll make up just really easy, just kind of a glare on it, but really easy dried flower ornaments. So you can purchase these like empty, and you know, these are plastic. So then you don't have to worry about uh, breaking them. You get them in the craft store, the top easily comes off and then you can just fill this up with um, dried leaves, dried flowers from your garden. Um, I put some uh, little dried citrus in there, some cinnamon sticks, all that type of stuff. So you can really fill it with whatever kind of natural materials you might have from your um, from your garden and then just add kind of a nice string on it and you've got a pretty simple um, ornament. You can put evergreens in there too. There's a little sprig of, sprig of evergreen. So you can get them in different sizes from the, the craft door. You can get round, you can get oval and flat, lots of different um, options to, to choose from. And then while you're at it, kind of gathering things from the the garden or from the kitchen, um, you can definitely just get with the kids and start assembling things together with all of those materials. So I love to use um, dried citrus for holiday decor. So you can string this to make a garland. You can make ornaments with it, cinnamon sticks, pine cones that you gather outside. Um, just kind of walk around your your garden or in the woods near you and see what kind of cool materials you can gather that you might be able to either glue together or assemble together in some way to make um, ornaments. I think it's just super so fun. Did, did you dry the orange slices? I've seen people do it before, but I've not successfully. Yeah. So I actually have a dehydrator, which is how I oh. did mine. So they're a little bit probably brighter than um, what you might get. But I know what a lot of people do is just use the oven. Mm -hmm. You can kind of cut them, lay them out on a cookie sheet, and then put your oven on like the lowest temperature. And I think some people even leave the door open too, so it's not super hot in there. Uh, but if you leave those then in a couple hours in the oven, they're, they'll are they dry pretty well that way. They tend to be a little bit darker. They're not quite as like bright orange as this, but it does the does the trick. Yeah, we, we tried that while also decorating and doing other things and forgot about them. In the <laughs> they're very dark, very much darker, but... Um, <laughs> It's a, it's I, I was a blood orange. See how it turned out, but so so it's pretty fragrant. Then when it gets done, is it's meant to have a scent? Uh huh. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, definitely. Especially when you add in the cinnamon sticks and pine cones and all that stuff. Yeah, I think it's pretty fun. Yeah. How thick cool. do you usually cut it? If, oh, probably. I don't know. Probably less than like a quarter of an inch. It really it depends how. Um, how long you're going to dry them for. Like if you, <laughs> you're going to have to dry them longer, obviously if you cut them pretty, pretty thick, those I just put into the dehydrator overnight and let them run. And, and that was all, all, all I needed. So not too bad. I like to do it too this time of year. If I, let's say I get some and maybe they're, they're starting to go bad a little bit in the fridge. I'm not going not gonna to get to them in time. Uh, I'll do that with apples too. I'll be like, well, I don't want to waste these. So I'm just going to cut these up, put them in the dehydrator and I'll save them for decorations later. So that way they don't go to, don't go to waste thinking ahead. Awesome. Okay. Well, if you guys have any other any questions about those or any other ideas for fun DIY, either ornaments or decor, definitely add those into the comments and we'll be happy to, um, happy to answer um, one of the other things, of course, are evergreens. And we we talked about um, evergreens in the last show. We talked about making a porch pot and wreaths and all of that. So you can, of course, can harvest kind of evergreens from your own garden to make yourself a, a wreath for the door or for the table to put a candle um, on top of. But Ryan, I know you've been talking a lot about evergreens uh, lately. You're just doing a news spot on kind of the different types of evergreens um, that you can use. Do so you want to kind of sh talk about that a little bit, educate us on the different types of evergreens we might have out there? 
Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, what kind of gave me inspiration to talk about this the last couple of weeks is just that, you know, we have so many of these evergreens, or I guess I've kind of focused on conifers because, you know, mm-hmm. evergreen just means it has leaves year round, which we have yeah. things like boxwood or, or rhododendron, you know, like broadleafed evergreens. So I've kind of focused on the conifers. So, um, and, and we've got all these species around right now that you don't normally see. And what would impress people more than being able to identify their Christmas tree for them? At least on the genus, you know, like if, mm-hmm. if you want to be that plant nerd at the at the Christmas party, um, there's really some pretty easy things we can do. So when I think of, um, you know, I kind of think in terms of Christmas tree species and, and things, um, you know, as, as to what are the conifers we see a lot of. But, you know, a lot of those same plants are used in, in wreath making and in other things. So you can see these plants, you know, just in a lot of places right now this time of year. So, you know, some of the big designations, uh, well, if, if we just talk about conifers in general, you know, what does that mean? Well, they are cone-bearing plants. So, you know, their fruits, those are that's kind of the basic general definition is they're cone-bearing plants. Their fruit is a mm-hmm. cone. And then they have either needle-like or spray-like leaves. So, you know, I think all of us, I think, probably know that needles are leaves. But mm-hmm. to some people, that's kind of even shocking to hear. Like, oh, my gosh, needles are leaves. But um, so if we look at just kind of those basic groups of conifers that we see as Christmas trees, as reasons, other things, it's usually spruce, pines, and firs that we see in those in those settings and there's really some kind of easy ways we can generalize you know is that a spruce a pine or a fir and so um, another another common uh, misconception from people that aren't plant people um, is just like everything's a pine tree you know and my own family members do that oh look at that pine tree it's like well no that's a spruce tree you know so (laughs) so if you can just you know if you're trying to get other people interested in plants and things just to point out the fact that like hey everything with needles isn't a pine tree is kind of a just even an interesting factor for kids. But, you know, we look at, um, you know, I have some little, some branch samples here. Here's a couple from pine tree. Um, and I have a couple different, let's see. Oh, maybe I just have one pine um, example today. Yeah, I lost a couple of my samples after yesterday's um, <laughs> show that I was on with this stuff. But, you know, the basic designation for pine trees is that their needles are arranged in the stem in bundles. So this is white pine, one of our natives. And if you can see here, all these needles came off as one bundle. So if you count them, there's five different needles right here, and they're all attached at the base in, in a bundle. Um, and, you know, so so a big part of pine tree identification is how many needles per bundle, where white pine, you know, native to Illinois, it's probably the only native species I'm going to talk about today, uh, but it, it's pretty unique in that it has five per bundle. There's really not any, there's no other native uh, pine in Illinois um, that has five, and really even few on our continent. You know, there's a couple. There's a western white pine. This is eastern white pine. I'm trying to think. There, there's some some non-native pine trees that have five per bundle, but that's pretty rare. You know, most of them are two to three per bundle, and I'd say, you know, probably the most popular, which I guess I've lo- again lost my sample of, but um, the most popular pine tree is probably scotch pine that we see, you know, in, in the Midwest and things. And it's just two per bundle and it's much, much shorter needles. I think yeah. a lot of folks don't like white pine because it's these super long needles. Um, and it's just, it's not an easy limb to hang an ornament on, you know, mm-hmm. where scotch pine, little stouter needles, little stouter twigs, and just kind of makes that better kind of decorative tree. But but that's that's the basics of pine trees. So so their needles are arranged in bundles and count the needles per bundle to get down to species. But if you just find these bundles on the stem, you can say, hey, that's a nice pine tree you have as a Christmas tree. Now, if we look at spruce, I have a sample here from Colorado blue spruce, you know, common mm-hmm. landscape plant, uh, popular common Christmas tree. Spruce needles are are single on are you know arranged singly. So when I pluck off a needle. It's just one needle. It's not, you know, it's not a bundle. It's just mm-hmm. one little needle here. So that that tells me if I just see singly arranged needles on the stem, that tells me it is spruce or fir. You know, so that gets into these categories where I'm really generalizing here when I say this, but like most spruce trees, if you touch them, they're spiky. You know, that mm-hmm. I think a lot of people, although I love this beautiful color of blue spruce, don't like it as much as a Christmas tree because as I'm hanging up ornaments, I'm getting prickled. You know, where another common one is Norway maple. And while it is prickly, it's not as, I mean, you have to work a little bit to feel it. Where with, with Colorado blue spruce, pointy needle, it's prickly right away, you feel it. 
Um, also, another factor on these is that the needles are very round. So they, they roll in my finger when I twist these around very easily. Yeah. So, it, so also we can see here, if I make a quick snip on this, cut off a little piece, you can see these needles are arranged radially on the twig. So there's kind of the bottom of the twig. They come out in all directions around the twig. Where if we compare this to a fir, this is Fraser fir, kind of, you know, our most common fir tree that you really almost one of the most common just holiday evergreens. Yeah, for sure. Fir. Just really easy to grow, like grows, you know, across a big swath of the uh, U.S. and just a really popular one. Um, its needles are, are pretty, are flattened. You know, it's mm -hmm. kind of hard to get an angle of this, but see, they don't come out on the bottom of the stem. They're really flat and they almost, oh, they, they come out of the sides and they curve up sharply. And, and then also on that topic of sharpness, they're really soft. They mm -hmm. don't prick my fingers if I touch them. So, so, you know, first be looking for bundles. So that'll tell you it's a pine tree if you find bundles. If you don't find bundles, look for that arrangement around the twig. And here, if I snip this, kind of give you the same view as our next look at arrangement around the twig, where you can see this is, you know, they come off the sides and they curve mm -hmm. upward on a fir. Um, and it's not prickly on a fir. It's real, usually really soft. Um, so that kind of, that's kind of puts you into the basic categories of at least genus you can kind of figure out. Um, you know, just a couple other points on conifer ID. I talked about spray-like vegetation and needle-like vegetation. All Everything we've looked at so far is a needle, but, you know, here's arborvitae, which is a, a, what we call a flattened spray, where you can see how it's, you know, it's, you don't see individual needles, really. It's kind of this whole structure is kind of like a flattened spray of vegetation. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, arborvitae, um, cedars, junipers, you know, kind of that whole group of plants there have this type of vegetation where another interesting fact, you know, here's a juniper that, you know, has something we would all call berries on it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, birds think of these as berries. They like to eat them. Um, but these are actually tiny cone structures. You know, technically to be a conifer, its fruit has to be a cone. So it's a berry-like cone structure, which is kind of neat. Um, and I don't have a great example of this, but um, on Eastern red cedar, our native, um, you know, kind of juniper species, um, it can have two different types of kind of this flattened spray type vegetation. Again, this is arborvitae, not red cedar, but it can also have kind of an all-like form mm -hmm. of, of leaf where it's, it's not flattened like this. It's kind of, it's still considered, you know, um, a conifer and everything, but it's, it's more pointy. It's just little sharp pointy um, needle. So that's kind of a neat thing I always look for on eastern red cedar is that, you know, all like versus kind of spray like vegetation on the same plant. So I think it's a little bit older of needles can develop that all like look um, where younger ones wouldn't. So mm -hmm. anyway, yeah, if, you've ever, if you've ever touched some of those like low growing junipers that people have as ground cover, you ever touch those and they're super sharp. That's like that. To me, that's that yeah. really short, all shaped, like super pokey <laughs> foliage this isn't fun but that's always neat when you can see two types of kind of two types of foliage yeah. in the same tree yeah that's super cool. i love that that needle trick that's what i always teach that too when i'm teaching master gardeners about conifers so we'll try to find like a spruce and a either a fir or a yew or something that that has kind of a different needle and you just kind of hold both of them between your fingers and you try to roll them and if it rolls really easily then yep you're looking at some type of spruce but if it's flat and it doesn't really roll then you've either got some type of fur or maybe a you or, or something different yeah, just those little tips tips and tricks yeah i didn't cover that the furs the furs don't roll that's kind of why i showed spruce rolls really yeah the furs are you know that it's probably pretty small to focus on but it, it's a little flat needle where it, it won't roll in your fingers easily Mm -hmm. Same with you. Yeah, that's a good example. Yeah, I like your point about the the radial with the spruce going all the way around and the the fur being much more flattened. I've never never compared that as much. So that's really good too. Yeah, and it's it's really generalizing too. Like if you looked at um, don't have my sample again, but if you looked at Norway spruce, it looks a little bit yeah. flat. I mean, it at least is it's missing needles coming out on the bottom of the stem, but they still mm -hmm. are coming out, you know, all around the top and sides, they're coming out. Where again, this, you know, this Fraser fir, while they look like they're coming out of the top of the stem, they're, they're just curving up really sharply. You know, they don't really come out of the top. 
or the bottom. They're, they mostly come out of the sides and they curve up. So Yeah, that's a good point. I always tell people, too, you were talking about the pine bundles and how you count the needles. I always tell people to, like, get several of them and count them and then kind of see what's the most consistent. Because every once in a while, I'll be teaching it and they'll be like, oh, there's three or there's four or there's however many, when really there should be five, it's just kind of a, one has dropped off or it's, it's a fluke and really check check a couple of them before you make a final kind of decision. Yeah, I mean, you, to confuse things more, some pine trees have two or three. Right, you yeah. Plant, you plant <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it, it, it at least puts you in a category. It's kind of like yeah. getting, for, for deciduous tree identification, it's like opposite versus alternate. You know, it kind of throws yeah. you into a category. Yeah. At least, and you can go from there where, um, I mean, really... For, at least for me on pine tree ID, definitively speaking, it's like down to the cone, the fruit structure. I really usually need to see on some. I suppose some there's like characteristic bark maybe that helps, but you yeah. know, number of needles and the fruit. I think if you can, if you know both of those about a pine tree, that's really all you need to know usually to identify it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Very cool. Awesome. Well, I hope that helps you guys kind of identify maybe you already have your Christmas tree up and you had no idea what kind it was. <laughs> this will help you identify that a little bit. I know I have found just over the years using evergreens and conifers as decor, kind of the ones that I prefer in terms of longest lasting and in use of the needles and such. So for example, you were showing blue spruce earlier. I love the look of Bruce, blue spruce when it added into containers or wreaths. Like I just love that bluish waxy uh, color, but I've found over the years, especially in a wreath, if I'm going to put that in the door, that is the first one that shed needles like everywhere. <laughs> they just do not hold on uh, very long. Where if I compared that to like a lot of the furs that might be in there, I think those, at least that's my personal experience, tend to kind of hold on a little bit longer. Do you have, you had any, any uh, findings on that at all in your experience? You know, I, I probably haven't measured them as indoor cuttings and how long they yeah. last, but I, I definitely believe that about blue spruce because it's, yeah. you know, we've probably all seen this in the landscape as a plant. It, it's quick to drop its needles as yeah. it gets chest and things. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, as, as an alternative, um, gosh, is it bicolor fur? I, I was, I'm always trying to think of the common name, but Bicolor fir is looks just almost exactly like blue spruce, you know, except oh, okay. obviously its needles are flat on this, you know, they range flat and kind of curve up on the stem and it's not prickly, but same color, a beautiful blue foliage. And I don't know if it would retain it longer, but it's something else to try if you're looking for yeah. that really blue color. Or, I mean, same to say, I would say the same thing as um, if you're looking to plant um, an, an evergreen that has that really blue color, Never would plant a Colorado blue spruce, but I would yeah. plant them on a color fir. They tend to do a little better here than blue spruce. Totally, and, yeah. Yeah, and most people from a distance wouldn't know, couldn't tell tell them apart, you know, unless you looked really close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. We've we I know we've touched on that on multiple shows because it's a common question we get all the time, especially to our master gardeners: is what's wrong with my Colorado <laughs> blue spruce? And usually they're about 20 years old or 25 years old and they, they bring a sample in and it's dying from the bottom up and it's just declining. And most of the time our answer is, well, unfortunately they're just, they're not adapted to our climate. And this is when the, the problems start to start to set in. So that, that, that's good that there's kind of a, an alternative that maybe you could think about adding in. You know, neither are negative or ni neither are negative. negative. So yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's not like bicolor fur is perfectly suited to our climate either, but it just has fewer problems with those, you know, like what really gets the blue spruces is a lot of those needle infecting diseases mm -hmm. that, you know, kind of mm -hmm. start to infect from the bottom up and just spread. And I mean, Ken, you could probably comment on a few insects. Yeah, I was just going to ask that. Yeah, you get bagworms and, and stuff in there. And surprising, it's usually the diseases, maybe mm -hmm. the needle cast and the and some of the canker stuff and yeah, it just builds yeah. up over time and yeah so i mean my, my recommendation for people is to either view it as like a short rotation plant in your landscape or you know it gets mm -hmm. it gets 10 or 15 years old and you're replacing it so maybe you plant them in in you know kind of like a succession planting of lettuce <laughs> only trees <laughs> mixed up where you just plan on removing them as they get a little bit bigger and older because they just right. get older and are less healthy or 
just don't plan on it as a long term, you know, um, have an alternative lined up. I mean, what white pine we've looked at is kind of a nice native mm-hmm. white evergreen. Um, you know, that's that's kind of a common recommendation I give or um, Eastern red cedar is a native is like in this county that I sit in. It's the only native conifer. Um, and, you know, I, th- I think people would complain about it a little bit because it has a kind of scraggly form. Mm-hmm. You know, eastern red cedar yeah. is not that perfect pine tree. That, that is like pretty, it. yeah. But they're coming out with some native R's that have different characteristics that have been bred for to make them more ornamentally appealing. What you know, one of which is just tons of berries. You know, I, mm-hmm. I think it was on a a Hort team uh, educational visit to Missouri Botanical and some other places in St. Louis. We saw one of those. Um, I saw one of those red cedar varieties that just had. I mean gosh, more berries than I can even imagine ever seeing on an Eastern red cedar out in the woods or in any mm-hmm. type of setting. Um, and so, so there's some more ornamental cultivars you can seek out if, if that's um, what you want. But I, I kind of like that look of it, just a little different of, it's kind of a more regular shape of a, a conifer. Um, I'll tell you, they're definitely tougher than nails <laughs> you uh-huh. know, on the crack of a sidewalk or something. So it's a tough tree, but uh, yeah. Anyway, there's always alternatives. Yeah, I think that's important because we get so many questions, especially people who have these as windbreaks, and they plant uh, a monoculture of the same exact. Let's say it's a whole line of blue spruce, and then they realize, oh, these are all going down <laughs> at the same time. So I think that's another tip too: is just to, uh, like you said, rotate if you have really something you really want in there. But really, the the best thing to do would be to have a diversity too of different um, species. I would say too, when it comes to conifers. Oh, definitely. And yeah, I mean, windbreak, visual break, that's probably their best use in the landscape. I mean, in my yeah. opinion, that's where I see yeah. the most. And yeah. so, yeah, having a diversity. Um, I mean, I, I really like um, Arborvitae yeah. for, for a visual screen. And I mean, they just come in a million shapes and sizes with the different cultivars that are out there. So that's a good one. I, I would say with, um, if you do plant a blue spruce, um, I kind of just talked about this issue in a Four Seasons webinar this fall, which I don't think we have posted up um, yet. It's not edited and posted yet because it was just at the end of November. But um, root, root collar issues are common on white pines, on blue spruce, on arborvitae. And, and you know, what, what that re- the best way to fix that is to plant those plants at the proper depth. You know, a lot, that whole problem of girdling roots, you know, it's, that's a root that grows around the stem and constricts it over time. Doesn't happen if you just plant the plant at the right depth. Sure. And, you know, we've talked about this in the show before too, that just it's, the, the problem is that a lot of this, these plants that come to us from the nursery are a little too deep in the pot or in the ball and burlap. So you have to do a little bit to find where those first roots kind of come out of the trunk when that's the depth they should be planted at in the landscape. So just always, you know, before you're ever planting any tree or shrub, always check for that root flare and try and get it at the soil surface. And if that's down the pot a little bit, you may have to plant it a little bit high. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm usually not making a very deep planting hole. It's usually pretty shallow on most plants and, and planting mm-hmm. high as opposed to too deep. Yeah. But I just know over the years I've seen, man, especially on blue spruce, and I would say probably white pine and blue spruce are the two biggest offenders in my experience for girdling root development. You know, some plants are just genetically more predisposed to develop those. And so it's it's just real important when you do plant one to get um, it planted at the right depth. Cool. Okay. Well, we've got some, I know, articles that we've got linked in the comments here on how to identify some of those evergreens. And if you want to let us know what kind of your favorite uh, conifer evergreen is, definitely let us know. Um, Ken, we haven't heard from you much on the conifer. What's your, if you had to plant one evergreen or conifer in your landscape, what would you pick? That's a tough question. <laughs> conifer, I'm not sure. Probably uh, cedar. Yeah, eastern, yeah. eastern red cedar. You'd well, go I, I say with that, if, if you're growing apples or something like that. Mm-hmm. Make sure you got the cedar apple rust resistance, resistant apples. Otherwise, you may be inviting yourself some some problems with that. That's a good point. Yeah, that's and that's a such a such a cool pathogen. <laughs> yeah, if there's ever was a cool one, 
Um, yeah, I think it's pretty, honestly. I think it's yeah. pretty cool when you, <laughs> when you do see it. Pretty on the, on the cedars, maybe not so much on the apple trees. Not so much on the apple, yeah. Do you want to explain that a little bit for those who may not know what we're, what we're talking about? So, so for cedar apple rust, it's one of the, probably one of the more common diseases we can get on apples. Um, for this, most diseases, they have a single host, but with rust, a lot of the rust, you have two different hosts. So to complete its life cycle, cedar apple rust needs some kind of apple, crab apple, something like that. And then a cedar, in most cases, an eastern red cedar to complete its life cycle. So in the, now the winter, spring, we're going to get these kind of kidney shaped round balls um, on the cedar. And then in the spring, these kind of orange tentacles will come out and those will release spores. And that's what's going to infect the apple plants and you'll get leaf spot and you can get defoliation if you get enough um, mm -hmm. disease on there. And then that, those will produce spores and those spores will go to the cedar and that just kind of, that cycle continues year after year. So if you've got, and those spores can travel long distances. So, um, you know, yeah. plus, so it's not like you completely eliminate the issue, but right. if you have issues with that or if you've got red cedars um, near you, you probably want to look for a, an apple cultivar that's got some resistance to it or be prepared to spray. Mm -hmm. apples. Yeah, I know when I first ever considered planting apple trees, I was like, oh, well, I'll just look around the neighborhood and see how many cedar trees there are. And just you know, maybe I'm far enough from one that it doesn't matter. But yeah, I mean, it's like I think I've read it's like a mile away or something. I mean, so it, it's just too huge of a distance. You can yeah, you could one and two. I mean, no way. Yeah, no way. <laughs> So you just kind of assume they're there, but I mean, there's lots of, I mean, that's been a focus of breeders for years now. So there's, there's lots of varieties that have that resistance. You just have mm -hmm. to look for it. Yeah. Make sure, make sure you're picking one that does or, mm -hmm. or be ready to spray. And same thing with um, like fire blight. You know, we've looked at plant apple trees in our yard, but our neighbors have a bunch of <clears throat> calorie pear that are loaded with fire blight. Well, Until those trees die. Want to hold off from planting apple trees. And wait. Stuff. Wait them out. <laughs> Fire blight is such a voracious one too. I mean, it is. you're gonna get it. You know, if it's mm. if it's on those calorie pairs close to you, you're. I mean, it's just almost inevitable. You'll have to deal with it. You know, back to the rust diseases though. There's also um, cedar hawthorn rust is one I see mm -hmm. a lot. So it's not just apples that it gets on, and cedar quince mm -hmm. rust is another yeah. one really seen rarely, but it, it can get on hawthorns as well. Um, so I've seen both of those, like hawthorn trees kind of as an alternate host too, is probably the most common I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. Something to keep an eye out for. And that's, you're talking about apple varieties and stuff like that. I feel like that's something that a lot of gardeners can be thinking about this time of year is kind of planning for, okay, next year I want to add this to the landscape and I want to add this. And the, I don't know, I haven't gotten a ton yet, but this will be the time of year where all the catalogs start showing up in, in the in the mail too. So uh, can any tips on, I guess, kind of planning or like what should they be looking for? Let's say if they were going to do some, some fruit trees, would you recommend kind of looking at a catalog, looking online? Like where would you start if you were wanting to plan something like that for this year, next year? Yeah, I think catalog or online. Um, would be good. You can get them from local garden centers too. Um, you're going to have the best selection probably online, mm -hmm. depending on where you live. And, and if you're looking for something specific online, again, it's probably um, going to be your best bet. Uh, but, you know, figuring out your location, you're going to need full sun. Um, they're going to need an area that's got some well-drained soils. They don't like having wet feet. Um, and if you're going to plant next year, um, probably start getting some weed control um, with that and then figuring out what kind of, you know, for Illinois, you can, and pretty much anywhere in Illinois, you can grow apples, um, kind of spring, kind of Springfield South, you can get peaches, even then that far North Springfield area is kind of iffy, more Southern Illinois, you can get into peaches and, and some of those, um, other stone fruit and stuff. So picking out what, what cultivars you want, um, with apples, you're going to need, um, to have pollinators and stuff, so you're gonna have two different mm -hmm. cultivars. A lot of them won't can't pollinate themselves, and some of them are sterile, so you need three different types. Um, so making sure and the, the blooming time, so you got to make sure you're matching up blooming times so they will pollinate each other and stuff. So there's a little bit of homework you need to do to make sure you're gonna be get apple production and be successful with it. And and with with pretty much all 
fruit and vegetables, I would look for disease resistant plants, especially if you haven't grown them before. Um, just getting that resistance there it doesn't mean you're not going to get the disease, but it's going to be a lot less likely. Uh, and you can kind of eliminate a lot of problems right off the bat, whether that be rust um, in the case of apples, um, apple scab, fire blight, some of those major ones look for resistance to those. And then, you know, for apples, what type of apple do you want? Do you want like a, you know, one you eat raw and you want one for cooking, you want to get into making cider and stuff. So there's, there's or, all kinds or, of when, or when do you want it ripe? You know, yeah. Cause there's a whole mm -hmm. yeah, do you want it yeah. Right? yeah, late summer into the fall. And, yeah. All, all kinds yeah. of factors play into that and, and stuff. So for, to figure out that cross-pollination equation, though, there's some pretty good um, charts online I've seen just for free that, mm -hmm. you know, nurseries will post where it's it's kind of like a matrix of, you know, this mm -hmm. one pollinates this one. And, and it's, yeah, all based on flower time. But, you know, what, one other question folks need to answer is what size of apple tree? So can you want to kind of describe maybe like the different sizes? Because that's a choice. Yeah, so you probably don't want to do like a standard apple because that's going to get... 30 some feet tall and get a ladder and all of that fun yeah. stuff. So usually you're looking at like a, a semi-dwarf. Um, that's what's typically going to be grown. Those will get you know 12, 15 feet tall um, with, with pruning and stuff. So you can you can reach the, most of those apples off there. There's also kind of fully dwarf apples. Uh, typically those don't have really big root systems. So you're going to need some kind of support. Usually those are going to be staked uh, or something like that because they don't have the root system to really support uh, those plants. Um, you can do something like a spalier and grow it on the side of a building. And I don't really know how to do that. So I can't, I can't do that. <laughs> it looks cool though. <laughs> yeah, no, it looks, cool. yeah. <laughs> it it looks like a lot of pruning involved is what it looks like. <laughs> you got a lot of time on your hands. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't have a lot of time on your hands, it's probably not the route you want to go. But yeah. So you're, you're probably looking at semi dwarf um, or dwarf if you want to provide uh, some support to those plants. You know, I've, I've planted a lot of semi-dwarf because, yeah, I kind of came to the same conclusion. I don't want a huge tree, and I don't want to have to stake. But, mm -hmm. man, I've had some some semi-dwarf trees that I probably didn't prune enough, like start to fall over and need some staking because they also have a restrict a smaller root system. But I think probably the biggest challenge other than disease management with apples is, like, pruning them enough every year to keep, mm -hmm. you know, that canopy from getting too out of control. That's That's been my big challenge. Yeah, and I think for most people, for homeowners and stuff, they're afraid of pruning too much. And it's kind of what I've always heard is when you think you're done, go ahead and prune some more. You probably haven't pruned enough. Um, a lot of the growers will say you want to be able to throw a cat through the tree. <laughs> so, wow. So you, you, want to, you want to have a nice open. Never heard that one before. That's a good way to look at it, though. I'll, I'll have to test that with my <laughs> apple tree. I just need a cat. Yeah. Thank you. I think you're right, though. I think a lot of people are scared to prune that much off. But when it comes to, to fruit trees, that's you really have to. And and the same thing with peaches, if you're on peaches. So peaches, typically, you're doing the, the open vase. So you're going to have four main stems coming out, whereas apples, you're going to have a central leader. Um, is typically how you're going to do it. So Awesome. Cool. So if anybody out there is thinking about Adding fruit trees next year. Start doing start doing your research, looking at those catalogs, looking at the online uh, charts and figuring out. And I would say order soon too, because I would have bet a lot of it's probably sold out even um, already. You got to kind of plan pretty early if you're looking for something specific too, right? Yeah. And if, if you order now, they don't ship it now. You know, they yeah. ship it at the right time. So yeah. get your order in. Absolutely. Cool. Okay, so if you guys have any um, questions, sorry, Ken, add them to that comment box. We'll be happy to uh, to help. What were you going to say, Ken? Sorry. I was going to say, and with your fruit trees, same thing with the seeds. Um, mm. You know, last mm -hmm. year, or we ordered seeds about a month earlier than we normally do, and we still there's still stuff we couldn't. We want some types of snapdragons we wanted to grow. We couldn't find them. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I think we're gonna we'll experience the same kind of seed seed shortages as last year. This year is what most folks I talk to are saying. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think ordered. so too. <laughs> Get them ordered. I mean, it's it's hard for us uh, gardeners because we're like not able to get the variety <laughs> varieties we want. But it's also cool to see. I feel like still how popular gardening is right now, which is really cool. I think more. It seems like more people are still gardening. 
and ordering these seeds and ordering all these uh, supplies if we, that we have all these shortages still, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, for it's sure. Yeah. It, is, it is exciting because it is really cool. Cool. Okay, well, hit us with any questions. We're just going to keep chatting through kind of what uh, what you can be doing in the garden this time of year or thinking about in the garden, of course, this time of year. So, uh, Ken, obviously outside, we're not too worried about insects this time of year because it's because it's winter. Uh, but we do still get the, the uh, questions that come in about maybe some pests that might come indoors. So what are what are some of the common kind of uh, insect questions or things you might be we might be thinking about these these winter months? Uh, so a lot of times this time of year, if you're getting a live Christmas tree, not a lot of times, but occasionally you'll get some hitchhikers on that. You know, yeah, that's true. I've always, my wife's allergic to, to evergreens, so we don't get a live tree anymore. But I always hope that we get like a, a praying mantis booth in case I can have them everywhere. But <laughs> That would be fun and exciting. <laughs> I, Merry Christmas. <laughs> For the I, insect guy, that would be very exciting. <laughs> You can have something like that. There could be aphids and, you know, basically there's insects coming off that you don't have to worry about them. <clears throat> They're not going to survive indoors. Mm -hmm. Same thing with um, firewood. If you have a fireplace, you bring a fire and you may have um, insects overwintering. If there's bark on it in that, you may have some wood boring beetles and stuff in there again. Once they get inside, they're, they're really not going to survive. So, you know, if you don't want them in the house, collect them, throw them outside, but they're not going to do any damage. Um, really to the house. It's just too dry. Um, and for the wood boring beetles, the wood in our house is just kind of too dry for them too. It's not going to, they're not going to be able to survive on that. Uh, sure. Another another thing is people are doing a lot of baking this time of year and maybe they haven't used the flour and stuff in a while. And you may have pantry pests, flower beetles, um, things like that. Um, Indian meal moth. We've gotten some bird seed um, as you open it and all the, the seeds are empty and now there's caterpillars and webbing and Moss mm -hmm. falling out of the bag and stuff. So, uh, pantry pests can be another <laughs> another common issue uh, this time of year. And and with pantry pests, you know, if you've got something like that, you want to make sure you dispose of that food that you have. If it's a bag of flour, um, dispose of it. You could stick it in the freezer for a while if you wanted to keep it. Um, and, and if you're grossed out by insects being in your food, there's there's tolerances for all your food for insect parts and and stuff. So you're eating insects anyway. You just don't know it. <laughs> So, so you're saying if, if they keep the flour and freeze it, then you just freeze the little bugs in there and eat them in your bread then whenever you make the... A little extra, a little extra protein for you in there. They're just not yeah. moving around. But they're still in there. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, and typically you're going to put that in the freezer for like three to seven days. <clears throat> Longer the better, obviously. You could also heat it like 140 degrees for an hour um, if you want to go that route. Or I'd say most people are probably just going to toss it. And if mm -hmm. you do that... Throw it away outside. Don't put it in your garbage can inside, um, especially if you know garbage day was the day before, because they're going to be in your house for a week or so until you get them out again. Um, just crawl out and escape back on you. Um, but then wherever you had that, um, the stuff that had a headless pest in there, you want to make sure you clean up those cabinets, uh, vacuum all of that. Um, a lot of times they'll, they'll show up in like bathrooms or something where you have lights and stuff, but they're actually coming from elsewhere. So cleaning that up, sure. dog food. Um, you know, if you've got, what well, after Thanksgiving, we've got like um, corn displays and stuff like that, that people may say they can get into that. So checking all that, vacuuming it, cleaning it up well, probably wiping it down um, to eliminate that stuff. You don't want to use insecticides really, um, especially if you've got it stored with food because you get that on that food, you need to toss all that food then and, and clean any dishes or anything that may be on there if you're going to use like a bug bomb or something. So you want to try to avoid that. Um, and then kind of long-term and, and kind of for the future, you know, putting those that flour, cereal, any of that kind of dried food um, in like metal containers that seal or plastic, heavy plastic containers that will seal up um, to keep them. If they do get in, they are in your, like your flour, they can't transfer uh, to other things that way. Uh, and you kind of try to avoid buying in bulk. You know, if you buy a big five pound bag of flour and it takes you two years to use it, there's a good yeah. chance something's going to show up in there. So <laughs> maybe buy a pound at a time. Um, use it faster. Yeah. Using the bulk stuff. Hey, so I know the, the main pantry pest we've dealt with is fruit flies. And they're, they don't seem to be quite as bad this time of year. But Ken, what's your recommendation on fruit flies? I know we've tried a number of different things at my house, but... 
Um, so it'd be, you know, use your food, use your fruit right away. And, and, and these are probably not your true fruit flies, what we call fruit flies, but like the vinegar flies. So they're more in, in overripe stuff. A lot of times in bananas and stuff, you could, you know, toss those in the freezer. That'll kill everything. And, and then you can pull those out later. Um, I just kind of don't leave fruit sitting out for long periods of time. Um, when it gets soft, they can get in there a lot easier. There are little traps you can buy um, that you put vinegar in and they'll, they'll go in mm-hmm. there. We've used um, yellow sticky traps. Sometimes we go and we just hang them up in our kitchen and they do a fairly decent job. But, so I guess I guess I, use your fruit and, and freeze it would be the kind of most common ways of the almost. So I probably have like the perfect setting for that because right, right next to our sink, I have a, a little compost canister. Yeah, that I, I try and it, you know, empty pretty regularly. And then right next to it, we have a bowl of fruit and a little banana hanger. And like, you know, inevitably there's an old banana there. Or there's something, you know, something that we don't get eaten. And so then I get this complex going of them between the fruit and the, you know, the compost bin, like, you know, and, and so, yeah, it's, so I'm always putting in the summertime, I'm always putting fruit on the back porch, you know, or something to just separate it from the flies that are there and, I've had pretty good luck with just basic, like the vinegar type or the, um, not vinegar, it's not vinegar, sorry, but like a little trap with a glass jar and a piece of banana in the bottom and saran wrap over the top and you poke little holes. And so the fruit flies go in and then they can't get out. And then you can dispose of, I just fill it up with water then to get rid of them. But that's yeah. kind of helped. I mean, I think I'm, I'm bad on the preventative side. I'm usually dealing with it on the <laughs> back end after they're there, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I usually pull out those little vinegar traps whenever I have a uh, something popping up, and that seems to work pretty good. So if, if you want an excuse to buy more plants, you can buy some like carnivorous plants, some sundews or something. Yeah, Ooh, that is there a really you, good idea. That's a good idea, actually. Yeah, because I, I have lot, plants right by there. Yeah, so they need a lot of light. They need full sun. Right? You could try a sundew or something. They've got those sticky leaves that would potentially. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Then I can just not worry about it. I'll plant, <laughs> do the work. Nice. Nice Good, excuse. <laughs> Good excuse. Good excuse. Because, yeah, they'd probably be too small for, like, a Venus flytrap, right? They probably wouldn't trigger trigger more, more. those, probably. Yeah. yeah. You could try You could do a pitcher plant. May, mm-hmm. get on there, but you got to have a lot of light for those. Yeah. Well, you know, nowadays, with all the little LED desk lamp kind of lights, I feel like I could just get a little LED to sit right over that one pitcher plant and yeah. soak up all those fruit flies. Now you got an there, you, there you go. <laughs> Time to go plant shopping. <laughs> yeah. Or add it to my Christmas list. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, the one thing I still uh, deal with every once in a while this time of year is I still get the stink bugs that'll every once in a while I'll be walking down the hallway and be like, oh, there's a stink bug on the wall. <laughs> get it and throw it away. But um, do people still deal with kind of those those other insects that are just trying to find kind of places to hide out this time of year too? Yeah, at, at this point they're probably Not where they're much. either in, they're in your wall voids or in your attic, um, things like that. So they're they're already in. If, if we get warm days like yesterday, they may mm-hmm. start around a little bit. But yeah, like you would in the fall, you know, scoop them up. Um, take them outside. If you vacuum them, I wouldn't necessarily use the the vacuum you use every day because you don't want that stink in the filter and all that and have to smell that all the time. Yeah. 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 That's never, never good. Yeah. I usually just get a paper towel and squish them right up. (laughs) Get them out of here. Cool. Okay. Well, I'm not, I don't see any questions, but feel free. We've got 10 minutes or so left. So if you have any lingering topics or questions, feel free to let us know, uh, but maybe we'll wrap up the show then talking a little bit more about kind of indoor plants, holiday plants. I know last show we um, we touched on uh, a couple of different things. Kelly brought a couple of different samples like Thanksgiving cactus. I know my Thanksgiving cactus are blooming like um, crazy uh, right now. Uh, and I went ahead and grabbed two. Another kind of fun project you could try this um, winter too is um, Kokidama. Uh, and there's actually, we have a gardening in the air program coming up in, I think it's in February where I'm going to demo how to make these and you can get your own materials and, uh, and try it out. But essentially what this uh, is, is a fun indoor way to grow houseplants. It's very similar to bonsai. If you've ever 
uh, growing a bonsai plant where you re really restrict the amount of soil. It's in a small pot. You prune it to kind of keep it uh, maintained. And that's kind of the idea with uh, kokidama is that you uh, limit the amount of, of soil mass. You replace the soil that you wrap around it with kind of a clay mixture so it holds a lot of moisture. And then they're just kind of, you wrap them in moss and you can hang them. You can put them on a tray. And it's just kind of a, a fun, unique way to grow uh, grow house plants in a in a different way. So there's what we have. I know some tutorials on our website that you can check out in the meantime. But that's just another kind of fun indoor um, thing you can think about doing with the kids or uh, by yourself. Yeah, I love, I love the look of that. It's just kind of a hanging little ball of coconutty stuff. Or so how, how do you how do you water it? Do you just so that's, the whole thing? That's the cool thing because so similar kind of to air plants where you can mist it, of course, but really what you want to do is let it soak really good. So I would say probably once a week or so, whenever I feel like this is getting pretty light, I'll just fill the sink up or fill a bucket up and then you can submerge that full moss ball, let it soak up for like 15 or 20 minutes or so, and then let it drain, let that water drain, and then you can hang it back up or put it back on its on its tray. Like right now, this is, I can feel it's really heavy, which tells me that there's still a, a pretty good amount of moisture uh, in there. But once it feels nice and light, then I will soak it and hang it, hang it back up, which is pretty cool. Really cool. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Yeah. And, and that's kind of a good teaser for our, our next show. So we're going to be back in um, January and our topic for that January show is going to be garden trend. So I think we'll definitely touch on um, houseplants and kokidama and kind of those, some of those trends that I know I'm definitely still seeing out there. I feel like indoor plants and houseplants are still uh, a really hot topic, which is cool to see. So Ken, any bug trends you can think of? <laughs> yeah. What, what do we got coming up in 2022, Ken? <laughs> They're so popular. Um, I think you know, we've got some, um, spotted lantern fly on the east coast that's slowly making its way this mm -hmm. this way. So that's something to be on um, the lookout for. It'll unfortunately it's, it'll be here eventually. So mm -hmm. um, on that one, you know, I, was, I read an interesting article about that. Um, I mean, it was from a few states east of here, uh, but talking about how, like, if you had a Christmas tree from another state, it could arrive mm -hmm. with spotted lantern fly on it. So, gosh, That's never true. thought about that way you can spread. That's a good point. That's a good point. And I would just, I would bet that a lot of the, there's a garden center just right down the road for me. I would bet that a lot, most of those Christmas trees did not come from Illinois. I would, <laughs> I would imagine probably, yeah. Something to keep an eye out for. Um, R Roberta commented, she said someone said they had a bunch of flies that came to life due to the warm weather. I think that with this, all this warm weather we've been having, I'm sure there probably are some, some pests coming up, coming out of the woodwork <laughs> like uh, because, because of that. That's a good comment. And then let's see, Erin had a question here. She said, I just moved into a new office and have a lovely south facing window. That's ideal for house plants. Um, I'm looking for easy to care for plant IDs help. So what would you guys recommend if you had a south facing window in an office? What would be your what would be your pick? Gosh, I think the sky's the limit with the south facing window though. I know, really. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's the ideal location. I've said before I really like jade. Like it's kind of like a tree, it's kind of like a succulent, you know, mm -hmm. it's um, I, and I just, we've had like one of our oldest house plants is a jade. So that'd be my choice. Some kind of yeah. How about you, Ken? What would you pick? We don't have a lot of house plants. Most of ours are <clears throat> weird <laughs> tropical fruit plants that I bring in. So we don't have oh, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So what uh, <laughs> could you grow like a little lemon tree or like a lime or a citrus in a south facing window? Yeah, you could try. You still may want to provide some supplemental light, especially uh -huh. real. we're not having terribly long days. Okay. Yeah, you could try. Um, I know growing up, we had um, asparagus fern. Um, mm. <clears throat> with, that was one of our house plants as a kid, and um, snake plant mother in law tongue. Mm -hmm. It's pretty indestructible. Oh, yeah, yeah exactly. 
Oh yeah, you got one there, Ryan. Awesome. Yep. Little yeah, one. I would they, say they get bigger. Yeah, I would say for an office, I mean, obviously a south facing window is ideal. You could grow a lot in there, but if you're a a newer to house plants or you don't want a lot of upkeep, then I would still go for something like the snake plant or maybe a ZZ plant or a, a pothos or a philodendron, like one of these that they don't necessarily need that southern facing window, um, but they're just super tough plant for an office, I think. Yeah, so. I think if, uh, especially if you're new to it, I think I would seek out, like we've talked about this in the show before, there's a lot of just like house plant specific stores that have popped up because they're so popular right now. And I think yeah. that's where I would go. And I've got some really good advice from folks that work in there. Not to say other places don't have knowledgeable employees, but I know if you go to just like the Lowe's Garden Center the other day I was in looking around at plants you might not get the best advice from folks there because they're not just doing houseplants. They're doing, you know, everything that's yeah. out there in the garden center where um, I think it's just kind of neat. Those, those targeted businesses are popping up. They have like a little more rare of plants or cool plants. Mm -hmm. and they can, for, for whatever level of care you do or don't want to give, they can usually send you home with the right plant for your light conditions and, and just, you know, how much care you're willing to provide. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I agree. You can get into to some of the succulents too. Those are pretty low. Mm -hmm. If you don't remember to water a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's and that could be good too for an office. I'm and so obviously with COVID, I haven't I haven't been in the office a ton, and I have a windowsill in my uh, extension office that I had just a bunch of cacti on it. And I'll tell you, I came back in there probably after a year, and I, clearly they're dead. But they just dried like how they looked, so they would pretty much look the same as they did <laughs> when I left. It's, and there's, I just left them. I'm like, oh, it's kind of a dried cacti uh, dried <laughs> forest in, in my office here. <laughs> so that's a that would be a good tip too. Cacti and, and succulents can't go wrong. <laughs> Love it. Awesome. Okay, well, we are just about at time. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today, talking all about kind of things we can be thinking about uh, in the gardening world this time of year. So like I mentioned, our next show, which is will be on January 20th, so in about a month or so, we'll be back to start the new year. And we're going to talk all about garden trends, things that we're seeing um, in the, the industry. And then we also put a link a little bit ago for our um, horticulture Facebook group. So don't forget, uh, if you're on Facebook, you can hop into that group. And if you have questions that come up, you want to share pictures, you can do that in there. And there's a lot of like-minded gardeners happy to help. So thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of the year. Uh, thanks for joining us. I think we are in, this is our third year for this show, our fourth year. I, can't, I don't even remember. But we want to thank you guys for always joining and um, asking questions. We really appreciate it and hope you have a great rest of the year. We will see you guys in 2022. Bye, everybody.